Hello, real ones. Welcome back to part two of our episode on Walk the Line. Apologies for the delay. I will address it and the future of the channel going forward later in the video, so make sure you hang around till the end. Thanks again for watching. So when we last left Johnny, he had just relocated the family to California, signed a new deal with Columbia Records, and as far as metaphors go, he was basically a plane operating on methamphetamines, traveling at its greatest height, whose engine had just stalled. Before we catch back to our movie timeline, I want to introduce you to a couple of people that the movie doesn't, but who are in reality people that had a huge influence on Johnny during this period of his life, and thus major events of the movie. The first of whom is this guy. Reverend Floyd Gresset, who ran a small church near where the Cash family had moved to in Casita Springs. Vivian recounts that Floyd came walking up the driveway with flowers in his hand on the first day in their new home. Floyd was apparently not subtle in his intention to befriend Johnny, and evidently it worked because Johnny started going to service at Floyd's church when he wasn't on the road, and also began spending more and more time with him up at his ranch in Pine Mountain. Or to put this another way, this was becoming Johnny's home away from home, while home from the road to do all the things he was doing on the road he couldn't do freely at home. Anyway, remember this guy because he's going to come up later. The second and much more important person we need to talk about though is the guy who became Johnny's new manager in 1960, Canadian promoter Saul Holliff. As Johnny's popularity across Canada was growing around this time, Saul had promoted some shows with Johnny as headliner, and despite a rocky first interaction over an issue whether advertising dollars should be taken out before or after the talent cut, Johnny came to know Saul as a man who stood by his convictions and, more importantly, a dependable one. And it was this dependability that Johnny sorely needed at this time, as it was something current manager Stu Carnall was showing less and less of. Stu and Johnny had mutually invested in a racehorse, and despite it never having success, Stu was spending more and more time at the track and avoiding his duties as Johnny's manager. While on a tour that was being co-promoted by Saul, Johnny was approached with a timely business opportunity that he wanted to get Stu on quickly. But again, Stu was at the track and unreachable, and the opportunity passed Johnny by. This would be the last call Stu would miss as Johnny's manager, and he was let go for his negligence. This put Saul in the right place at the right time. He had just pitched a massive set of tour dates across Western Canada to Johnny, and his combo of attention to detail, mixed with big picture thinking, was incredibly enticing after having previously dealt with the exact opposite in Stu Carnall. Furthermore, Saul took the initiative to contact Columbia Records on Johnny's behalf and got them to renegotiate parts of the contract he had just recently signed in his favor, such as the label's involvement in promoting him in the new markets. It wasn't long after this that the opportunity to formally manage Johnny Cash knocked, and Saul was at home to answer it. Now, if your homework from part one was to read Vivian's memoir, then your homework for this part is to read Saul's, The Man Who Carried Cash, written by Julie Chadwick. Saul, not surprisingly, was a meticulous record keeper, and the information that was left in his storage locker and discovered by his son was the material used to create an award-winning documentary, and subsequently this book. It's important to make the distinction too that Saul never intended for this information to get out to the public, as he had been actively donating and getting rid of the material for a long time beforehand, so it has a certain credibility against being seen as a jaded old man's attempts at a tell-all. I highly recommend this as it's not only a fantastic story of a son attempting to learn who his father was, but it's also a great look at the music managing industry in general and it has some real revelations about what being part of Johnny Cash's orbit was like at the time. Much like Saul Goodman was to Walter White, Saul Holliff was consigliere to Johnny Cash in nearly every way, and after reading this book, I am convinced that without Holliff as his manager during this time period, Johnny never would have been able to navigate the minefield that his life had become. His effects on the story have already been felt, as he was the one who negotiated Gordon Jenkins' $75,000 settlement for the issues surrounding Folsom Prison Blues that we mentioned previously. He's also the one responsible for originally bringing June Carter onto Johnny's tour. So, as we move forward from here on, you'll hear many references to Saul, and now you'll know who I'm referring to. Oh, and again, go read or listen to this book, it's fantastic. So when we pick back up in the movie, it's 1964, and it does play a little fast and loose with the timing and sequence of things regarding Johnny and June's relationship, and Vivian's finding out about it. But let's get into some saucy stuff. Hey! Johnny and Vivian attend a country music award show together where Vivian meets June for the first time. Now, this is true that this is where they met for the first time, but it was several years earlier in 1958, and it was a bit different in real life. 
Firstly, Johnny never insulted June's marriage history and whether this one would stick or not, and this is not where June would be convinced to come back on tour with Johnny because, as we mentioned in part one, June didn't even join the tour until 1962. She would briefly leave the tour, but under entirely different circumstances that we will circle back to. Anyway, Vivian's remembering of her first encounter with June consisted of her constant mentions of being a God-fearing woman, but that she felt right off the bat that there was a certain lust for her husband that June was not doing well at keeping concealed. All of this underlying tension was likely punctuated by the next time these two cross paths after this. Vivian and some of her girlfriends went to a big show of Johnny's in Bakersfield that June happened to be booked for. Afterwards backstage, everyone was gathered around celebrating their great performances. June at one point allegedly brought to everyone in Earshot's attention, Oh my god, Vivian, what is that on your coat? Is that dirt? and pointed to a small dark stain on the shoulder of what was Vivian's favorite white leather jacket. Now, I say allegedly, but can I picture quick-witted and naturally funny June Carter, who had pretty much been a celebrity her entire life, coming up with a petty dig off the top in an attempt to humble someone who she probably perceived as some basic bitch that married way above her level and had what she wanted? Oh, <laughs> Jessica, did you just fart? It worked too, as Vivian admits that she stood there embarrassed and unable to muster an answer while June just laughed it off. Well, by the time June had officially joined the tour, Vivian was not only suspicious of her, but she had also begun to notice some things about Johnny's behavior that was raising questions as well. For one thing, when he would talk about the tour during the time when he was at home, a lot of that talk centered around June. And while this alone might have been just the paranoia of a jealous wife, Vivian was also hearing rumors from Luther and Marshall's wives about the way things had been going while on the road, and that Johnny and June were not very discreet in their romantic pursuits of one another. When she asked Johnny about these accusations, he just assured her that there was no truth to them and to not believe the gossip, which is basically only one step above the classic advice given by Shaggy. Wasn't me. But in reality, Johnny and June had an undeniable chemistry, and Johnny himself says, I knew I liked her right away a little too much. It's not hard to see why they gravitated towards one another honestly. Both of their first love was music and performing, and they bonded as they experienced the highs and the lows of them together. June was also basically country music royalty, and that only added to the extreme allure Johnny had for her. One night shortly after June had joined the tour, they all piled into the caravan of vehicles to head to the next stop, and because of the full load and limited seats, June offered to sit on someone's lap. Johnny quickly offered his, and somewhere over the course of the four to five hour car ride, something must have come up to clue the pair into the fact that there was an attraction there. Peanut. But the exact moment they started hooking up appears to be after a show in Las Vegas like we see in the movie. And in looking at Johnny's touring schedule for 1962, that would put that during a week-long stint in May of that year. They both realized this was going to be a major problem though, seeing as they were both with other people, with June having just recently gotten married to her second husband. Even if she left him, being a twice-divorced woman immediately in a sexual relationship with another man just meant something different in the 60s especially when that man is married with children. Time to torture me, I'm home! June would be seen as a homewrecker, no matter how unhappy that home might have been. And it was, and it was getting worse. Being that on the road with June was the only place he really wanted to be, Johnny was using even harder when he was at home in an attempt to numb his lament in the only way he knew how. This would see him running 22 to 23 hours a day most days in an endless vicious cycle of pills to bring him up and back down as needed, and running on a diet of cigarettes and alcohol. Vivian noticed this, and while she may not have fully understood what was happening yet beyond Johnny's addiction just getting worse, she knew something was wrong. Finding and then flushing pills was becoming a regular thing, likewise were pleased to her husband to get some help and get a grip on this before it killed him. June had put the picture together too by this point, and she let Johnny know very early on that despite how deeply they felt for one another, that she could never be with him on any sort of permanent basis until he could get his addiction under control. Watching helpless while the person she loved slipped further and further from her grasp led June to write one of the greatest songs of the era, Ring of Fire. Now while a lot of people know that June wrote the song, what most people don't know is that it was never meant to be Johnny's to perform. June originally intended for her sister Anita to be the one to sing it. However, Johnny said that in a dream he heard the song being accompanied by mariachi horns and that he would give Anita six months with the song to make it a hit. But if it didn't, he was going to record it the way he envisioned it. Anita's version, Love is a Ring of Fire, did not chart well. And so after the six month period was up, Johnny recorded his version and as we know, it would become a smash hit. I don't know about you, but I just find something inherently funny about taking what was meant to be a touching and interventive ode and saying, okay, yeah, that's great, but let me show you how it should sound. 
Another thing that's not well known or even hinted at by the movie is that Johnny was not the only one in the relationship suffering from addiction issues. June herself had become hooked on amphetamines early in her career after being introduced to them by her good friend fellow artist Patsy Cline, and she would struggle with staying clean as well throughout her entire life. One of the things she was known to do from time to time when finding Johnny's pills was to down them in front of him during the heated argument that would ensue after confronting him. This was likely a huge factor in her insistence on him getting completely clean before she would agree to marry him. Having a hard time staying on the wagon herself probably made her feel like she couldn't be responsible for both of them, and frankly that he was bad for her sobriety as well. However, one of the revelations Vivian makes in her book is that she believes June did not actually write Ring of Fire but that Johnny wrote it one day while fishing with co-writer Merle Kilgore, and he had told Vivian that he was giving the writing credit to June because she needed the money and he felt bad for her. Johnny also apparently wrote the song about a certain part of the female body, if you believe Vivian's telling of this. But I don't. To be honest, when I first heard this, this is one of the things I found to just be in the vein of a bitter ex-wife, and when you think it through, it makes perfect sense that it's just a lie Johnny told to try and cover the tracks and it worked for a little while. But being fucked up nearly all the time was causing Johnny to get sloppy in hiding his affair with June. Vivian began finding receipts for gifts and extravagant things that he had purchased but that was unable to be accounted for in their home. She was essentially unable to accompany on any tour dates at this point and the phone calls were beginning to get less and less affectionate. Vivian recounts one instance where Johnny was hesitant to say that he loved her or even say her name. Or I guess to put this another way, he was acting kind of shady in calling her baby. Baby, 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 baby. Anyway, Vivian recounts that she forced Johnny's hand and was able to squeak in, I love you, Viv, out of him. Later, she says preacher Floyd Gressett, remember him, gossiped to her how June had in fact been present with Johnny during this and had gone ape shit when Johnny acquiesced to telling Vivian he loved her. The nail in the coffin, however, turned out to be one fateful afternoon when Johnny was in the middle of sleeping off a bender. While passed out in his chair, he began talking, however Vivian listened in and soon realized who her husband thought he was talking to. Suddenly it all made sense for Vivian. All of the rumors, the receipts, ring of fire, the paranoia, the gut feelings, all of it now made sense. With all of the mounting evidence, Vivian confronted Johnny and laid out how she knew something was going on between he and June. Johnny simply promised, it's over, she's off the tour. And as we know, she was briefly, but that was due to Johnny's worsening drug problems, and it wouldn't be long before she was indeed back on again. Vivian obviously protested this, but this fell on deaf ears as Johnny just began spending less and less time at home, and this would become his way of dealing with the issue by not dealing with it. This led to Vivian confronting June face to face and accusing her of trying to break up their marriage. We see this in the movie, but it's framed a little differently. June meets Johnny's parents for the first time, and when he goes to introduce June to the children, Vivian bows up and tells June to back the fuck off. Stay clear of my children. Vivian, I, I was just saying a lot hurt me. Mm. You have to remember though that at this point in the movie, Johnny and June's first hookup hasn't happened yet, and their entire romance has pretty much been solely presented as him pursuing her and her rebuffing his advances. This doesn't really appear to be all the way true, and if Vivian's accounts are to be believed, it happened a little bit differently. Firstly, there would be two confrontations between them. One on the phone, where Vivian accused June of the affair, and June not directly admitting to it. The other was backstage at a show like the one we see in the movie, but it's described as an ugly, tense five minutes of yelling, posturing, and June getting the last words, which were apparently, Vivian, he will be mine. Now at first, Johnny struggled with the idea of divorce and breaking up their family for the sake of his children, and even when he did broach Vivian about a divorce at this point and a half a million dollar settlement to go with it, she flat out refused because as a devout Catholic, she claimed she'd rather die than divorce. I am never giving you a divorce. Ever. But even if she hadn't, it's not as if Johnny could have afforded anywhere near that much at the time, for reasons we will get into later. The point is that there is a lot of question marks surrounding who was pursuing who and responsible for what. What's not in question though is that at this point in Johnny's life, he had completely lost control of his vices and everything was starting to burn down around him. And in a bizarre parallel to what his entire life was becoming, in June of 1965, a drug-fueled Johnny would lose control of a campfire while out with his nephew in Los Padres National Forest, and would ignite a wildfire that destroyed 508 acres, and essentially wiped out the endangered condor birds that called the area home. 
when questioned about it, he gave an explanation of how his car had gotten too hot, malfunctioned, and shot sparks causing the fire, and that the car is dead so you can't question it. When pressed about the damage he had caused to the condor's habitat, he simply responded, I don't care about your damn yellow buzzards. This refusal to show any remorse for his actions began to turn some of the public eye against Johnny, and it's at this point in the movie we see him lose it and black out on stage. Now the part about him collapsing on stage never happened, and while he did have a tirade, it didn't happen in Vegas, but rather happened at the Grand Old Opry in October 1965. To hear Johnny's explanation of what happened, it didn't really have anything to do with June either. There was a microphone issue, and in his inebriated state, he angrily swung the mic stand and broke out one of the front stage bulbs. He found the way it exploded so beautiful that, as he put it, he decided to just drag the mic stand across the entire row of them, busting them all out in the same way. This got him booted from appearing ever again at the Grand Old Opry, however the band never left Johnny after this like we see in the movie. In fact, they never left at all. Johnny's drug use and erratic behavior were well known amongst his bandmates, with Luther Perkins even coining the advice, he'll sleep for 24 hours. If he wakes up, he's alive. If not, he's dead. That irritation he showed on stage was probably partly due to what had happened just shortly before as well, when he was arrested in El Paso for trying to smuggle in just over a thousand pills he had bought over the border in Juarez, since he was not able to get the amount he needed any longer from just doctor's prescriptions. Now this happens after in the movie rather than beforehand, like in real life, but that's not really that big of a change. Unfortunately for him, the man he bought them from was under FBI surveillance for moving heroin over the border, and so he ended up walking right into the crosshairs of their investigation. So like we see in the movie, he's taken into custody immediately upon his arrival into the States, and the pills are found on him. What's not really shown in the movie, aside from a brief shot of a newspaper headline, is what this arrest did to Johnny's image. As we mentioned before, the public eye had started to sway a bit with his behavior, and Johnny had been arrested before several times for things like public intoxication, reckless driving, and hilariously for trespassing while drunkenly picking flowers in someone's yard late one night. But this time was different. This was widely covered in the media, and getting caught trying to sneak drugs into the country tarnished Johnny's reputation with conservative church folk, his main paying audience, and of course tanked any chance at pursuing a successful gospel avenue at this time. Now, this may have increased his rep with prisoners across the country now that he was seen as just more of a badass than they already thought. The thing is, incarcerated convicts didn't buy records. Before we go any further, really quickly I have to tell you a couple of amazing Johnny arrest stories I found during research. One of these came after getting himself in trouble in Carson City, Nevada one night and being forced to share a cell overnight with a pissed off lumberjack who didn't believe Johnny was who he said he was. Nervous he would be on the end of a prison beating, Johnny began singing some of his big hits and slowly eased into some gospel in an effort to placate his massive celly. The man never did believe he was the audience to the most exclusive Johnny Cash prison performance of all time, but he eventually fell asleep and our boy was able to escape unharmed the next morning. Another time was when he borrowed June Carter's Cadillac and crashed it into a telephone pole one afternoon. The collision sent Johnny's face smashing into the steering wheel, breaking his nose and knocking out a couple of his front teeth. Nervous about the repercussions, he fled the scene and left the vehicle there. Hilariously enough though, one of the responding officers was Edwin Nix, the man June Carter was still technically married to. Even though the affair might have been an open secret to some in the know, this was still small town Tennessee, and so to avoid scandal, no report was ever filed, and so Johnny never got in trouble for fleeing. But could you just imagine for one second being Edwin and having to explain that situation to your fellow officers? Uh, yeah, that crashed and abandoned vehicle does seem to look a lot like my estranged wife's. Yeah, it's weird. Crashing stuff was not out of the ordinary though, as Johnny had crashed several cars, a trailer, and plenty of tractors and farm equipment over the years, which is where the tractor crashing scene comes from later in the movie. Speaking of car crashes, Johnny and Vivian's marriage had become a freeway pileup at this point, but initially it seemed as though the El Paso arrest could be the thing that saved their marriage. June Carter had left the Johnny Cash show shortly after the arrest, even if it was just a PR move to mitigate damage to her own career, and in his time of need, Johnny reached out to Vivian and she would be there when he was released. However, what should have been a wake-up call for Johnny to get his life together turned out to be anything but and it wouldn't be long before Vivian reached her breaking point. Less than a year later, after a particularly nasty fight following which Johnny disappeared again, Vivian visited a doctor where she would get some sobering advice. Gaunt, weak, and a shell of herself due to the constant crying and surviving on cigarettes and coffee, 
Vivian was told that if she would continue down this path, it would be someone else raising her daughters. Her greatest fear was that this would be June Carter. So despite her misgivings against divorce, and despite the fact that she was still in love with Johnny, she signed the papers in June of 1966 as a means of what she saw as survival. Since Johnny had gone AWOL on a bender again, he would not even receive the news of the divorce filings until they were made public in an article in the Nashville Examiner in an effort to get him to show up to their initial proceedings, which he ultimately did not. Instead, this would be handled like all other problems in his life at this point, handed to his consigliere Saul. In the movie, this particularly nasty fight plays out in the form of Vivian getting upset about Johnny hanging pictures of June, or I'm sorry, his band, in his den early one morning. Now this is the last we see of Vivian in the movie leading up to their divorce, and the way the events around it are framed are, let's just say a bit dubious. Let's see if you can spot it. No, I said Viv. please don't hang these, John. No! Viv, get back here. Viv. 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 I'm kidding. Give me the... So I mean like, yeah, Johnny pinned her to the ground in front of their kids and all, but she totally deserved it because she attacked him first, right? All over a picture? What a crazy bitch. Vivian does unfortunately say that once or twice the children did see Johnny rough her up a bit, but it was never anything physical enough to bruise or scar her. Every once in a while, he give him a little slap. This would lead to the period where he briefly lived at the Fontaine Royale Apartments in Madison, Tennessee, with, at the time, little-known singer-songwriter Waylon Jennings. Jennings was deep in the thick of his own battles with addiction and was also in the midst of divorcing his first wife, so the two had lots to bond over, but by all accounts, the men were in and out so much that they rarely saw each other. They did have this comical relationship and an unspoken agreement, though, to where they would both attempt to hide their individual drug problems from one another, even though it was an open secret that both were train wrecks, which had to have been hilarious in the saddest way possible. This apartment would become notorious during this time period in country music circles, though, as a friendly stabbing cabin, or a place one could indulge in the things that they were not supposed to be doing in front of prying eyes. Okay, so remember when I said that it wasn't as if Johnny could even afford to financially go through all the troubles that came with a celebrity divorce? Well, the reason for this is because the name Johnny Cash was not the draw it had once been anymore by this time. He had botched so many performances, either by outright ghosting or by being there, but in being such poor condition he would be unable to perform, that he had garnered the moniker of No Show Cash. One of the most notable of these was a potentially very lucrative live performance at Carnegie Hall that Saul had painstakingly lined up, the same type that fellow artist Harry Belafonte had won a Grammy for the year before. However, one of the side effects of the drugs that Johnny was on at the time was that they ran roughshod on his vocal cords, and when he went to open his mouth to sing in front of the packed house, nothing came out. Unable to sing at anything higher than a whisper, the recordings were stopped and a huge opportunity was blown. This became such a frequent occurrence that everyone was beginning to see through the revolving door of excuses, such as slipping and breaking his ribs on ice, or his laryngitis. I got the laryngitis. And eventually it got to the point where no major promoters would touch the name of Johnny Cash, and the only places Saul could get him booked were small fairs, gyms, and hockey arenas. Shows he was still missing regularly. The lawsuits from other fires Johnny had started were beginning to mount as well one of them being for $125,000 from the federal government for the literal forest fire a year and a half before. In addition, there was a growing number of them being filed by promoters and fans alike for the increasing number of missed performances, including a major one from the Illinois State Fair for no showing a gig there. There was also the ugly fallout from the split with former manager Stu Carnall as he believed he was owed $13,500 for back unpaid expenses. In an effort to alleviate the financial burdens, Saul stepped in to save the day once again and negotiated terms for a sizable loan from Columbia Records, on the conditions that Johnny take a royalty cut on his next two albums, since the last one had not been up to expected quality. 
he would also need an executive at Columbia to co-sign for the down payment needed to build the Henderson Mansion. In the movie, he happens to stumble across his future home at the end of the June Carter Love Walk of Shame and offers to buy it. But in reality, Johnny was the one who had the place constructed at the cost of $150,000. To top all of this off, Johnny was still spending money exorbitantly and was still making accusations of Saul of double dipping, which he was not. He was also asking Saul to take another cut in commission, even though those were becoming fewer and farther between. These constant attacks at his character and the growing number of roles he had to play in Johnny's life as his fixer were causing great strain on Saul and the already tense relationship between the two. Despite all of this, Saul would be there to help navigate the terms of the divorce, and fortunately so for Johnny because Saul had a friendly relationship with Vivian, mostly through the years of having to be the one to break it to her when Johnny wasn't coming home, then doing his best to comfort her over the phone to get everyone on to the next day. This friendly rapport only went so far though, and by the time the divorce became finalized in fall of 1967, Vivian would be awarded half of the revenue from the music made during their near 14 years of marriage, as well as half of the current assets, the house in Casita Springs, and just over $2,500 a month in alimony and child support payments. So while she got what I believe was rightfully hers out of the settlement, she still lamented in her book that she should have fought harder for her marriage, and that she loved Johnny and mourned the loss of their little family for the rest of her life. She would eventually remarry Ventura, California police officer Dick Diston, great name, and they would live out the rest of their lives together until she passed away from complications of lung cancer surgery in 2005. Now obviously I have made some tongue in cheek jokes throughout the course of this review, but it is my true hope that you will come away from this as I have with a newfound image of the woman Vivian Liberto truly was and not the caricature the movie presents us with. Despite the enormous cost to him, Johnny Cash was now legally a single man and free to pursue marriage with June Carter something he had ached to make a reality for years now. The problem was, June had had enough of the drugs and the erratic behavior by this point and informed him that at the end of the current tour they were on in October of 1967, she would be leaving not only the Johnny Cash show, but him as well. This was what finally pushed Johnny over the edge, and in his despair over his divorce and the thought of having to also let go of June, he swore to her to kick his addiction and to bring God back into his life. Enlisting June and Marshall Grant's help, along with a Tennessee-based psychiatrist, Johnny would sweat out the poison and fight through the withdrawals, and for the first time in a long time, Johnny Cash emerged into the start of 1968 clean from pills. Now, this is the last we see of Johnny's struggles with his addiction in the movie, but anyone who has actually been through the war with substance abuse can attest that the battles never truly end, and in real life, it would rear its ugly head again and again over the next coming decades. However, the timing of Johnny's decision to get clean at this point would prove to be fortuitous as some things were shaking up at Columbia Records, and an up-and-coming producer named Bob Johnston had come in and recently been named head of the Nashville part of their outfit. This would be great news for Cash as Johnston was known for being a risk taker and a guiding force behind his artists when it came to battling the execs on their behalf. Johnny had long toyed with the idea of cutting a live record at a prison, but in the past the prospects had gone nowhere. When he pitched this idea to Johnston, however, he was immediately receptive to it and saw the big potential it could have. Like we see in the movie, the rest of the brass at Columbia were hesitant to fund this experiment, and in real life it went even further than that, with threats made to Cash and Johnston that if they proceeded as planned, it would be the end of both of their affiliations with the label. The two held their ground though, and the gamble paid off, as soon the label executives balked and they were able to secure a date of January 13th for their prison record but it was not lost on either man the gravity of this situation, and that possibly more than any performance in his life, this was the one that Johnny could not afford to be anything but at the top of his game. Feelers were put out, and Folsom Prison would be the first to respond, and thus would be the chosen venue. Now while the 1968 performance is easily the more well-known one, Johnny had actually performed here once before in November of 1966 at the behest of preacher Floyd Gressett, who did some outreach with the prison. So he did have some familiarity with the place, but that first show had taken place outside, and this one would take place inside the prison. That brings us back to our frame point in the movie, and it truly was the pivotal moment of Johnny's career. The way the scene plays out is fantastic, and when looking into the real events surrounding the performance, I found some nice extra content and what I believe are a couple of little nods to certain things. 
For starters, there's the bit where Johnny mentions that he admires the men in the audience even more, as tougher than he could ever claim to be, because he's never had to drink the disgusting yellow water they have at Folsom. Johnny then smashes the glass and says, this song's for your warden, much to his chagrin. Now, this is amazing, and Johnny would become an advocate for better prison conditions in America, but this didn't happen. It is, however, clearly inspired by something that did happen at his performance the following year at San Quentin. During the gig, a photographer came close to the stage and made the request, John, let's do a shot for the warden. His response was one of the most famous photos ever taken of him as he emphatically flipped him the bird. It would later become a meme before memes were even a thing and served to just enhance his image as the ultimate rebel. And I believe the yellow water crack is our movie's proverbial middle finger. The next thing is a bit more obscure and maybe I'm reaching just a little, but the story behind it is fascinating and I want to believe it's a small tip of the cap to it. In the movie at one point during the Cocaine Blues performance, one of the audience members yells out the line and Johnny acknowledges the man briefly. This can't be heard in the actual live performance recording, and it could be something that they just did and left in there, but I believe they are referencing a specific man in the audience that day, singer-songwriter Glenn Shirley. Now, this wasn't the first person who was in attendance at a Johnny Cash prison concert who would later go on to become famous. Merle Haggard was in the audience during Johnny's 1958 performance at San Quentin, but this was very different. At the time, Shirley was serving a life sentence at Folsom Prison and had written a song called Greystone Chapel, and by way of doing outreach, a copy of it ended up in Floyd Gressett's hands. The night before the show, Floyd gave this to Johnny and relayed Glenn Shirley's story to him. Moved by the beautiful lyrics, Johnny decided to perform this as the closing number of the show, with Shirley sitting in the front row, completely unaware of what was about to happen. The song would become a hit and the two immediately hit it off when they met after the show. Amazingly, Johnny would also end up lobbying and getting Glenn Shirley released on parole into his custody and would begin the process of trying to bring him up as a potential country star alongside him. I wish this story had a happy ending, but unfortunately it does not, and I think that's why it's not directly mentioned in the movie. Glenn Shirley had been in and out of jail several times over the course of his life, and to a degree, he had become institutionalized. This would make it hard to adjust even to normal life, much less when following the trails of a celebrity musician where there are temptations around every corner. Eventually their friendship would dissolve, and in the shame of feeling as though he had let everyone down, Glenn Shirley sadly, um, unalived himself at the age of 42. This deeply affected Johnny as he felt as though he bore a personal responsibility to Glenn and that he had failed in his duty to him. From here on, Johnny would abandon the idea that he was capable of ever saving anyone, which is sad irony given that I'm sure his music and his story has ended up saving several lives over the years. In any event, Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison would be a huge commercial success and would end up resurrecting and revitalizing his career. The next year's performance at San Quentin we mentioned earlier would end up being his first record to hit number one on not just the country, but also the pop charts as well, and produce the song A Boy Named Sue, which would reach number two on the singles charts. Johnny was back in a big way, and this coupled with another major event that was about to happen in his life would be enough to convince the music world that he had finally grown up and earned back their trust. I'm talking of course about his marriage to June, and the way we see it play out in the movie is pretty much what happened in real life. After several failed attempts, Johnny finally believed he had reached a point in his life by kicking his habits and reaffirming his faith to where he could convince June to marry him. And so on February 22nd, 1968, he proposes live on stage during their performance in London, Ontario, Canada. Or at least, that's how some people view this. Look, I'm sorry, I know this is supposed to be a romantic moment, but the way the movie frames it, I can't help but just look at this as a pressure move to dare June into rejecting him in front of an audience who, at this point, just desperately wanted to see them together. But maybe that's just me being a dickhead. Dickhead! Anyway, the rest is history as we know. June finally agrees to marry him, and less than two weeks later, on March 1st, the pair would wed in Franklin, Kentucky and I cannot be the only one who is just a little disappointed that they didn't end up getting married in Jackson. But I digress. There's a short scene right towards the end where Johnny and his father sort of make up, I guess, after Johnny's dad hit him with that knockout punch of a zinger. Who are you to judge? You ain't got nothing. Big empty house, nothing. Children you don't see, nothing. Big old expensive tractor stuck in the mud, nothing. 
talk about a tough pill to swallow. This seems like a good point to circle back to where things would play out for the two. Like I mentioned before in part one, there would certainly be some unspoken bad emotions Johnny harbored for his father for the rest of his life. But whether the two ever truly got right with one another sort of depends on which of Johnny's accounts you believe. In 1975's Man in Black, Johnny had nothing but good things to say about his father and the hard work it took to keep the family going in Dias. Whatever bad feelings lingering from childhood, Johnny seemed to have forgiven him at this point, which given his own life struggles and reaffirmed faith, would have made sense as the Christian thing to do. But when Johnny would later relapse, Ray's role in his life would slowly fade into the background, and in 1985, Ray Cash passed away. When Johnny wrote his second autobiography published in 1997, it was much different and far darker than he had previously been willing to express. This time, Johnny didn't have anything good to say about his father. He claimed Ray never stopped drinking and doubted the legitimacy of his father's conversion experience, even going so far as to say that even though he preached in the church, Ray was a self-described evil man. After he was gone, Johnny said that he didn't think of his father often and didn't even visit his grave, despite how close it was to his house in Tennessee, which probably says the most. I believe the reason for these dual depictions in the two books is that Johnny waited years after his father's, and more importantly his mother's deaths, to be more honest about whom he thought his father was. He also very much resented his father for not urging him to pursue music earlier in his life the same way that his mother did. Part of it also probably had to do with the second autobiography being written in a time where his health was seriously failing, as Johnny stopped touring completely the same year it was published, and he likely felt little need to overprotect his father's legacy. In any event, it unfortunately does not appear that they ever truly reconciled their issues with one another. But that's basically where the movie leaves it, ending with a customary epilogue. Johnny Cash's story, however, was far from over, and so to put a bow on Walk the Line and his amazing life story, I'm going to cover some of the notable things that would happen in the coming years that the movie does not cover. For starters, about seven months after the Folsom performance in August of 1968, Luther Perkins tragically died in a house fire when he fell asleep with a lit cigarette. The movie gives us a small nod to this in the scene on the tour bus after the performance when Johnny takes a lit cigarette from the sleeping Luther and puts it out. Luther's death affected Johnny on both a personal and a professional level as the men were not only close friends, but as we covered before, Luther Perkins was an integral part of the band's sound. At a time when their careers were just beginning to really take off again, one can only imagine how differently Johnny's music of the 70s and 80s might have sounded with his longtime guitarist creative input. In addition to the career resurrection the Folsom performance brought, an increased coolness and importance on the Man in Black image came along with it. Now Johnny had played several roles over the course of his musical career, from the cowboy, to the frontiersman, to the Indian, to the cotton picker, to the storyteller, but from 1970 onward, the man in black became his signature look for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it was cool, and a stark contrast to the rhinestone outfits and overly try-hard cowboy get-ups that were all over 70s country. I'm a cowboy. It's like, you're a cowboy? Really? Cock-a-doodle-doo! A bang, 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 bang. Fuck out of here. The other more important reason Johnny would spell out himself in the lyrics to the 1971 song Man in Black from the titular album. I'm not going to read the entire song lyrics, but if you've never heard it, you should go give it a listen right after this to get the full effect. The last two stanzas really drive it home, though. Well, there's things that will never be right, I know, and things need changing everywhere you go. But till we start to make a move to make a few things right, you'll never see me wear a suit of white. Ah, I'd love to wear a rainbow every day and tell the world that everything's okay, but I'll try to carry off a little darkness on my back. Till things are brighter, I'm the man in black. The Man in Black would serve as Johnny's living embodiment of his fight against social injustices, and for his contributions, it would eventually lead him all the way to the United Nations Humanitarian Award in 1978. This big resurgence in his career at this time also reopened the door for him to try his hand on screen as well. ABC had approached him about the idea of hosting a Saturday Night Musical variety show, and on June 7, 1969, the first episode of The Johnny Cash Show hit the airwaves bringing the music of the likes of Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, Chris Christopherson, and many others to the public saw the show do very well and get renewed for a second, and then a third season. However, before the third season could begin shooting, the show would be mysteriously cancelled. Reasons for this vary, with some believing it to be a casualty in response to the primetime access rule going into effect, 
but another reason was likely due to the increasing amount of religious-related content making the final cut of the show. Around this time, Johnny had become acquainted with famous fire and brimstone preacher Billy Graham, and it was this influence that saw him take a hard turn towards evangelical Christianity, eventually having the preacher on the show himself several times to give sermons. This shift from music to religion was beginning to be noticed by the networks, who hadn't really signed on for this when conceptualizing the idea. This went beyond the Johnny Cash show as well, because during this period Johnny only seemed to have interest in projects centered around his faith and little else, ultimately shrinking his target audience. It would also have lasting effects on his relationship with Saul Holliff. Saul had dealt with issues of what he perceived as openly being disrespected by Johnny at times, and also the stress of never really feeling secure in his position. But this shift towards evangelism was something he saw as not only likely a mass marketability problem, but also an uncomfortable situation for him personally. Saul was an ethnic Jew, but was essentially an atheist, and just did not agree with this change on multiple levels. He begrudgingly went along for a little while, even going to great lengths of arranging a passion project for Johnny centered around a film about Jesus' life and an accompanying gospel soundtrack. The reality was, unfortunately for them, that the labels didn't like it, a great deal of the mainstream fan base didn't buy it, and Saul's secular sensibility was directly opposed to it. This led to a contentious altercation between Saul, Johnny, and June, where she accused Saul of hating Jesus and having issues with their faith. At this point in his life, Saul was miserable on all fronts, and this was the final crack in the already collapsing bridge. He officially resigned as Johnny's manager in 1973 in what he saw as an effort to prevent certain early death. He would retire from show business entirely and receive a bachelor's degree in history. Then on March 17, 2005, eight months before Walk the Line was released, Saul Holliff unfortunately, um, unalived himself. His absence was absolutely felt in Johnny's life in multiple ways, and unfortunately the two never really reconciled because, as I mentioned earlier, I truly believe that without the guidance, hard work, and dedication of Saul Holliff, Johnny Cash's music career realistically could very well have flamed out in 1965, and one must imagine his life could have swiftly followed. Hopefully this review has done something to bring some minute recognition to a much deserved and incredibly important cog in the Johnny Cash machine. Anyway, this was also around the time frame that Johnny and June welcomed into the world their only child they would have together, their son John Carter Cash. John was a musician himself, even performing as part of his father's backing band at times, and also served as one of the executive producers of this movie. As I alluded to in part one, unfortunately I think this is the major reason why certain things are left out of the movie and things are framed in the way that they are. Which I guess I would understand on some level had he not published a book not long after the movie came out called Anchored in Love, an Intimate Portrait of June Carter, that delved a lot into the troubles that his parents' relationship would later face, saying, Many people's understanding of my mom and dad's love story is that after they got together, it was happily ever after, and it was not. I briefly mentioned earlier about Johnny's relapses. The truth is, Johnny still took drugs intermittently throughout these periods of time, and with the only exception being a seven-year period beginning in 1970, but by all accounts, he seemed to have things under control. That was until he hard relapsed in 1977 after being kicked by one of the llamas on his farm, no I'm not making that up, and then getting hooked on the prescribed pain meds. Johnny's erratic behavior ran wild again, and there are even some reports of infidelity. It apparently got so bad that June had divorce papers drawn up in 1979, but the two eventually were able to reconcile before anything was signed. That didn't mean the problem went away though, and the growing tensions from Johnny spiraling again would cause a major rift between him and bassist Marshall Grant, and because of this Grant would leave in 1980 to become the Statler Brothers manager. A short time later, Marshall also sued Johnny for retirement embezzlement as he believed Johnny was pilfering money that was supposed to be being set aside for Marshall and Luther's eventual retirement fund. Due to this lawsuit, Johnny reorganized and later expanded his backing band calling it the Great 80s 8, and this was essentially the end of the Tennessee 3 era. The suit was settled out of court, and eventually Johnny and Marshall were able to reconcile and reunite for one final appearance together in 1999. Speaking of the music, by the mid-70s, the shine of the resurgence had worn down quite a bit, and the hard truth was that Johnny's new music was not doing well, and the shows were not drawing anymore. There were a few reasons for this shift. Firstly, he had made some commercials for Amico and STP, which were under serious fire in the mid-70s for the energy crisis of the time, and what was seen as shilling for these companies was not a good look. 
The other was quite honestly his lean into gospel, since this just didn't sell in the same way that his country music did. I'm with it. I'm hip. Johnny not only noticed the dwindling crowds, but also noticed that he was slipping into doing the worst thing that an artist can do, according to him, burlesquing himself. Or in other words, trying to be like Johnny Cash instead of just being Johnny Cash. While most people think of the late 60s as Johnny's rock bottom period, there is actually a much better argument for this late 70s, early 80s period. Despite being made the youngest living member ever inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame in 1980 at the age of 48, due to the declining sales, Johnny would officially be dropped from Columbia in 1985. He did have a short stint at Mercury Records, but really did nothing of note there and left in 1991. It was around this time in 1992 though that Johnny entered his final stint in rehab and was finally able to kick his addiction for the remainder of his life. In 1994, he would link up with another aspiring record producer on the cusp of giant things in the music industry, Rick Rubin. Rubin had co-founded Def Jam in the late 80s and had been one of the driving creative forces behind its early successes, but was ousted after a dispute with owner Liar Cohen. He had just founded his new label American Records and was a big fan of Johnny Cash, and he had decided he wanted his first official project on the label to be with him. Ruben met with Johnny to outline his pitch for his vision of the record, to basically just sit in his living room with nothing but the two of them and a guitar, and that Johnny would be free to just record everything he had ever wanted to, but for some reason had just never materialized. History would repeat itself again, as just like himself and Sam Phillips before, Johnny Cash and Rick Rubin each took a chance on one another, and it paid off huge. These sessions would make up the 1994 record, American Recordings, which would be a critical and commercial success, going on to win a Grammy and serving as yet another path to mainstream resurgence for Johnny. He toured again throughout the 90s until, like we mentioned before earlier, his health deteriorated to such a degree that he was forced to stop. He would see one more career resurgence while he was still alive with the release of 2002's American 4, The Man Comes Round, where he notably covered several popular late 20th century rock songs such as Personal Jesus by Depeche Mode and Hurt by Nine Inch Nails. Unfortunately, just like the movie points out though, on May 15, 2003, June Carter passed away from complications following heart valve replacement surgery. Heartbroken at the loss of the love of his life, the only thing Johnny would live for from this moment on was his music, reportedly having Rick Rubin prepare a studio in his home that was accessible to his now wheelchair-ridden body. He would continue recording all the way up until he was hospitalized and unable to, and on September 12th, four months after June Carter passed, Johnny would follow due to complications from diabetes. The legends of their careers and their love story would remain in the hearts and minds of people all the way until present day, and I suspect will remain that way in perpetuity. As far as where the movie itself comes into play, a movie about Johnny's life had been being kicked around since 1993, after his guest appearance on Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. He and June became good friends with Jane Seymour and her ex-husband, director James Keach. Johnny would ask Keach to consider making a film about his life, and it would be in development hell, lacking any studio interest until 2001, when James Mangold had rewritten the screenplay and pitched it to Fox 2000. Joaquin Phoenix got to meet Johnny Cash a few months before he learned of his casting. Despite feeling as if there were several other actors better equipped for the role, Johnny specifically chose Phoenix as who he wanted to play him in his biopic, having been a tremendous fan of him in Gladiator. Phoenix and Reese Witherspoon both went through extensive vocal and singing training for their roles, and they both absolutely crushed the mannerisms and the singing styles of those respective roles. I especially love that Joaquin Phoenix nailed Johnny's distinctive cross strumming style on his guitar. As we already know, the movie would do fantastically well at the box office and the awards, sweeping the Golden Globe's big three categories and netting Reese Witherspoon her only Academy Award thus far for Best Actress, as well as getting Joaquin Phoenix a nomination for Best Actor. It would also remain the highest grossing musical biopic for a decade until it was surpassed in 2015 by Straight Outta Compton. Ooh, another potential future episode name drop coming straight out of my mouth. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! As far as my final thoughts go for this movie, at the end of my research, despite a few things missing or being a bit poorly represented, I still believe that this is a great telling of the story of who Johnny Cash was as a person, and I still adore this movie. It ranks somewhere around the top of my ranking as far as musical biopics are concerned, and it's one that I revisit again and again. 
and oddly enough, even the inaccuracies being present gives it a weird extra sense of authenticity to who that person was, because Johnny Cash most definitely subscribed to that old Mark Twain philosophy of never letting the truth get in the way of a good story, and he was well known for being a bit of an unreliable narrator, and an exaggerator. I think Chris Christopherson probably summed Johnny and this movie up best in his song. He's a walking contradiction, partly truth and partly fiction. Thank you everyone for watching this. I truly hope you enjoyed this review as much as I enjoyed making it. I never meant for the delay between part one and two to be so long, and I wish that I could say it was 4D chess and I was pulling a Johnny Cash and no showing my obligations, but the truth is I stepped away for a bit because I needed to reassert who I was doing these videos for. Ultimately right now, it's myself and that's okay. That being said, I would like to be able to get content out at a faster clip, and so I've been kicking around some ideas on how to do that. I'm going to continue with the Real Story videos as long form content, but also going to add a second series called Real Talk where I delve into some TV shows and just some other stuff that I find interesting. That's fucking interesting, man. That's fucking interesting. I'm also a slut for rankings and lists, and so there will likely be some of those two in between the big stuff so that I can stay more active. In any event, be sure to check us out on Facebook to keep up to date with what is coming next. If you'd like to make a suggestion as to what that should be, or if you think I missed something, leave that as a comment down there-ish. Do all the things to all the buttons if you haven't already, it helps a lot. We also have a Twitter now because I guess we have to, so do with that what you will. That's all for now folks, thank you again very much for watching. Until next time, be safe, be happy, and remember... Keep it real, homies. June and Marshall Grant's help, along with the Tennessee-based psychiatrist, Junie Junie. <laughs>